Breaking the fast is an interesting tradition, and it's uh, something that fasting in many rituals and cultures and religions is an important element of, of belief and, and tradition. And it has many, many layers to it in, in 
different faith communities. But one of the universal elements I think is beautiful is that God is really calling us to look for significance in our life, to pull away and reflect and really see what God is calling us to do as an individual, as families, and as congregations. And that's what you're doing tonight by bringing us all together, and we're very, very grateful for that. How do we serve and honor God more effectively and faithfully? One of our chaplains, Chaplain Azael, some of you probably know, shared with me a passage from the Quran that I thought was beautiful and really uh, exemplifies and causes me to think of a, of a story from my faith tradition. And it says this, O believers, we believe in Allah and what, he, what has been revealed to us, and what was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and his descendants, and what was given to Moses, Jesus, and other prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and to Allah we all submit. It's a beautiful passage, and it calls us to this concept of what does it really mean to submit to our God? What is the ultimate and true expression? And it reminded me of a story that was a favorite of mine growing up in, in the faith tradition of Christianity. Some of you are probably very familiar with it. It's called the, the Good Samaritan. Some of you know that story very well. It's the story of, of a man who, who travels from Jericho to Jerusalem, and on the way, he finds himself confronted by robbers. And these robbers don't just take his, his uh, possessions, but they, they beat him badly, they take his clothes, and he's left there, humiliated, beaten, bloodied by the, the side of the road. It's not clear how conscious or unconscious it, it is. But the story goes on to say that a religious man was not too far behind and began to come upon the gentleman who was laying in the road. And the religious man, we might, as we read the story, think, this is wonderful, a religious man is going to be here to help this poor soul. But the story tells us that the religious man was too busy and could not be bothered with the battered and bloody body of the man by the road and continued on. The story continues to tell us that another man, another religious man, followed not too far behind, maybe there was hope here to stop and take care of this brother in the road. But the story goes on to say that this uh, religious man also was too busy and could not be bothered by taking care of this man beaten and bloody by the road. But there was, shortly following that, the stories of the Samaritan. Now the Samaritans in that time were not loved by the Jews. In fact, there was hatred amongst them. So here is a man who knows that he's hated by the very person that he is um, compelled to help. And the story tells us that this Samaritan reaches down and in great humility tends this broken body that's by the side of the road. You have to think about this at that time. Um, there was a lot of resources. It was a very humbling thing to do to take care of this man who didn't have clothes, he was beaten, he was bloody. There's, there's several points that, that jump out that I think uh, connect and tie us together tonight. One was the immense compassion that that Samaritan man must have shown. He, he humbled himself. He didn't ask uh, or take any time to determine who this man was, what his family was, what his wealth was, what his politics was, what his religion was. In fact, he probably knew that if this man was conscious, he might even reject the very compassion that this Samaritan was about to give. And yet, the Samaritan, full and overwhelmed with compassion for this broken body, took the time to care for him. He, it, it also calls us to this thought of action. He didn't go for help right then and come back. He took action upon himself, and the resources he had, and the time he had, and the knowledge he had, he put to work. And he realized that God had put him in that place for a moment to take action, to help relieve this. And then he realized that he did need to bring other people into this situation. So he, the, the story tells us he gathered up the man, and he took him to a town, and he took him to an innkeeper. So he realized in his humility that he was not able to fully care for this man. So he had to take this man to another place to get another level of care and support for him. 
We're in a community where we have lots of diversity. We live in a world that hatred is uh, alive and well. And a story like this, and a festival, and a celebration like this reminds us that God has called us to action and humility, to love one another, to have compassion on one another, regardless of our faith origins, our, our ethnic origins, where we grew up, regardless of all that, we are sons and daughters of God, and God calls us to care for one another. Now, every time I read a story, or see a movie, and I don't know about you, but I always find myself identifying with the character. If I watch a heroic tale, I tend to think of myself as the hero in the movie. <laughs> it's interesting in this story, when I read it, especially as a boy, I read it as I was the Good Samaritan. I was that compassionate individual who reached down and humbly took care of because that was what God called me to do. But not too long ago, I heard someone talk about this story, and it challenged my thinking, and I want to leave you with this thought tonight. What if we turn the tables on the story just a minute, and we visualize ourselves not as the Good Samaritan, but what if we visualize ourselves as the innkeeper, the person who was running the inn that the Samaritan brought this broken body to? Think about the message and how that shifts a little bit. And the Samaritan now is represented by God. God finds the broken bodies. God's compassion spills out upon the broken bodies. But then God, in His infinite wisdom and His recognition of us being brothers and sisters, brings the broken body to you and to me as the innkeeper. And God says to us, innkeeper, I'm asking you to take care of this brother. It's amazing to think that God uses broken people to take care of broken people. And so as we celebrate and as we uh, enjoy this festivity tonight, as we draw our, our reflections to what God has called us to do, I'd like to leave you with that, that maybe God is calling us to be the innkeepers in our community, the place where he brings his children, and he asks us, do what you can for them, and don't worry about the bill. This is for per appropriate for hospitals. <laughs> don't worry about the bill, because I, the God of all of you, have got this covered, but I'm asking you to take care of that dear brother. God bless you all, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight.
Welcome to all of you, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. January 4th, 2007. Just start my timer before they start releasing me. January 4th, 2007, Congressman Keith Ellison from Minnesota goes to his swearing in ceremony. And he makes a request and he says, Look, I'm a Muslim and I'd like to swear in on the Quran. And what's so beautiful about the country in which you and I live, our country, is they accommodated him. But they accommodated him in perhaps the most beautiful of ways. They brought him a Quran, they went to the Library of Congress, the largest library in the world, and they brought him a copy of the Quran that was over 200 years old. And it had inscribed on it the letters T and J, standing for Thomas Jefferson. They brought Thomas Jefferson's personal copy of the Quran from the Library of Congress for Congressman Keith Ellison to swear in on. But the story doesn't stop there, it gets more interesting. The question is, why did Thomas Jefferson have a Quran? And not only in the formative years, but also in the later years. Because as you know, Thomas Jefferson's library was burnt. And after that remaining was the Quran, which suggests that he actually purchased the Quran not once, but twice. They say the first time he had the Quran was when he was an early law student, a young law student, he had got the Quran to try to understand the law. At the next level, he actually purchased the Quran perhaps once again in order to actually write the Constitution of the United States of America to try to see where divine and worldly wisdom can actually lead an individual. But uh, in her book, Dr. Denise Spielberg, uh, in her book, Thomas Jefferson's Quran, she highlights an interesting contrast here. That she says that Thomas Jefferson, as well as the founding fathers, such as George Washington, came forward and they were looking at Muslims at that time as theoretical constructs. Individuals were not yet on our shores, but perhaps in the future, at some point in the time, they would eventually be in America. And so it was much like in the early days in America, at that time, roughly the estimates say they were about 20,000 Catholics in the early stage of America. There were roughly 2,000 Jews, and it was not known necessarily to the founding fathers that they necessarily had Muslims on their shores. They were talking about people theoretically who eventually may come to the United States. But Dr. Denise Spelberg, who's at the University of Texas at, at Austin, she says that it's very possible, if not probable, that Thomas Jefferson actually was unaware that there were Muslims on the shore of America at that time. In fact, he may have owned them as slaves. And the evidence that she gives of this is that not Jefferson, but Washington, that is George Washington, the first president of the United States, when he filed his taxes, there was one entry on his taxes, in fact two entries, that state that his property, as you know at that time, slaves were considered property and were to be listed on taxes. And in the entry on the taxes was found two particular names, Fatima and Little Fatima. Now if you know from the Islamic tradition, Fatima is the name of the daughter of the Holy Prophet of Islam. And she's considered someone of the highest order, along with Maryam and, and, and the likes. At that point in time, what Denise Spielberg comes forward and says is that he perhaps was working for a model that was mental, that was intellectual, that was of the mind. But perhaps he did not recognize, perhaps, that Muslims were actually living amongst the early founding fathers of America. Why do I say this? The purpose of us gathering here, and perhaps the purpose of fasting, the purpose of people of faith, the purpose of citizens of our republic, is perhaps to not only intellectually understand things from the mind, and I'm a big admirer of Thomas Jefferson, I have uh, many of his pictures and his writings on my walls, he's one of my heroes. But it is not sufficient for us to understand something intellectually in the mind, although that is necessary, but it's perhaps not sufficient. That is, there is a continuum of the mind, of the body, and of the spirit. The mind, the body, and the soul. These need to be in unison. This is perhaps why the great religions of the world, whether it be the likes of Hinduism, or Christianity in the Catholic tradition, or for example, Islam, or Judaism, on Yom Kippur and other dates, that they come forward and fast. It's not only to just fast to stay away from food and drink. It's not that only. That's a very limited understanding of what it's about. It's to actually connect the mind with the body, with the spirit. That when I feel, I feel to try to make myself better, but at the same time, I'm also trying to feel the empathy of what it's like not to have a meal at the end of the day. That is, I and you may have that luxury, but until I live it, I cannot really empathize. The Bible, you will find in Exodus, gives the example, and it says, how does it describe God? And I want you to understand this in relation to the Bible as well as the Quran. 
in Exodus we find that the term in the Hebrew Bible is used Rachel, meaning compassionate. The first term that's used to describe God is the compassionate. Every single chapter of the Quran, 114 chapters, with the exception of one, 113 of those 114 begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That is in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Why? Why in these faiths was God described as compassionate? And what does it tell for you and I? Do we embody the compassion of God in our lives or not? It's a moment for you and I to reflect. Fasting is not just about staying away from food and drink. It's about feeling the pain of those who may be suffering, to feel that compassion. What's interesting is Hebrew as well as Arabic are Semitic languages that have their same roots. And what's interesting is the Hebrew word and the Arabic word, Rahman, are very similar in that regard. In fact, you will find whether it's in Hebrew or whether it's in Arabic, the term for the womb, the womb where the child is carried by the mother is Rahim. It derives from the same compassion of God's compassion. A moment for you and I to reflect. I'll try to make this more substantive for a moment. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to be in London. And in London, I went to the great Westminster Abbey. And when I went to Westminster Abbey, I'm standing there in the pages of history, if you will, that was established in 1245, this place where the, you know, the ruling elite of the British uh, or for example, coronated, many of them are buried. But I wanted to share with you what the reverend said there at that point in time. And he shared a passage where Jesus, peace be upon him, he cures the leper. That is, leprosy has been this disease that has existed throughout history where the skin gets affected, where the person gets affected, and typically and historically, the leper were, were relegated outside of society. But Jesus didn't say it was sufficient to just talk about serving people. It was not sufficient to just talk about, care about the lepers. No, he lived amongst them. A leper, he looks forward and he speaks out to Jesus and he says, if you can purify me, purify me. And Jesus was not only willing, but he was able to. And he cured him of his leprosy. One principle that we get, the mind and the body and the spirit must be connected. It's not enough for me to say that I care about people who have less than. I have to be it. When we come to the Quran, the same individual who will follow in the line of Jesus, peace be upon him, is the Prophet Muhammad. This individual came forward, and not my words, the word of the Emir Stein Institute, that came forward from the first documented anti-racist in history is the Prophet Muhammad. He, they argued that they said, look, other people in history, they said, we're not going to be racist ourselves, we're not going to be discriminatory ourselves. But he was the first person who said, it's not enough for you to just say that you won't be. You need to make a conscious effort to make sure that everyone is equal. That's why H.G. Wells, the author of War of the Worlds and many other books that Hollywood has made into movies, came forward and he said when he wrote his history of the world, he went through the entire history of humanity and he summarized it for us. And he said that we say that the slogans of the French Republic that emerged, the models, liberty, equality, fraternity, liberty, legality, fraternity, they came in the 8th century. You know, if you don't understand the French Revolution, you don't understand why we do much of democracy in America the way we do. That is when we say what the right is saying or the left is saying, that comes directly from the French Revolution. That is, the, the president was in the middle and on the right you had the loyalists of the king, and on the left you had the loyalists of the republic. And we still use that terminology. And the slogans of the French Republic were liberty, equality, fraternity, liberty, equality, and fraternity. But H.G. Wells says that when we say liberty, equality, fraternity, that is brotherhood, emerge, or sisterhood, emerge in the 18th century, we do an injustice to the history of humanity. He says that if you want to see liberty, equality, fraternity, you have to go to Arabia in the 6th century, and you have to see what Muhammad did at that point in time. Because he is the one who first brought to our world in a documented fashion. What did he do? There's a moment in time he's given a sermon, Muhammad's giving a sermon, and there is the person who is white and black, the rich and poor, they are all sitting next to one another, and there's a man who's sitting in front of him who is of a poor class. And a wealthy man comes and he's wearing his garbs and his robes that are very luxurious. And when he comes to sit down with the wealthy man, the rich man takes his clothes and his garbs and he swings it away as if to try to protect himself. And Muhammad stops his ceremony and he looks at the rich man and he says, why did you do that? Did you think that his poverty would come onto you and attack onto you? Did you not realize that this was a, a, a creation of God? Did you not realize this was your own neighbor? This not, did you not realize this was one of your own? A moment for you and I to reflect. We are one common body. We are one community of God Almighty. I see our friends from the different backgrounds, from different communities. 
This is something compassion of God is held by every major religion on this planet. If you go to our Sikh friends, they have this concept of daya, and this idea of compassion for others. They do this concept of langar, that they feed people indiscriminately, regardless of caste, color, and creed. Because that's a right that they understand that's sacred, that people are supposed to be fed. It doesn't matter your caste, color, or color, or No questions asked. We can learn from these beautiful elements of society. Another moment that I want to share with you is, Often the challenges that we face in society, Ramadan is a moment for us to reflect, the month of Ramadan, on these concepts. Many of the issues and challenges that we face in our world are, be, are symptoms of another cause. We see the symptoms. We see injustice, social injustice, racial injustice, other injustice, but we don't address the root cause that may be there. Allow me to explain. 1897, Dr. Emile Durkheim, he writes his book called The Suicide. He was a professor at the Sorbonne in France, that is the University of Paris. And he realized something very interesting that was going on in the world at the time. He was living in Paris at the turn of the Industrial Revolution. So Europe was going from agrarian to industrial. It was going from a farming-based culture and society and economy to a more industrial economy. And although that brings tremendous benefits, he noticed something stark that is a moment of reflection for you and I. What did he notice? He noticed, looking at in, in Europe of that time, he noticed in Italy, in England, and in Holland, or the Netherlands, he noticed at that time, Italy was the most agrarian, the most farming economy, England was in the middle, and the Netherlands and the Hollands were right at the top. They were the most developed. You'll remember the Dutch East India and the Dutch West India Company. New York is called New Amsterdam, as you know, so they were very developed at the time. At that point in time, when they came forward, he noticed that as industrialization increased between Italy, between England, between the Netherlands or Holland, as industrialization increased, and this is 124 years ago, he recognized, or 25 years ago, as industrialization increased in society, so too did the rate of suicide in society. That is, as industrialization, now I'm not here against capitalism and or industrialization, they have their benefits, but they may have some side effects. The same way if my doctor, my physician tells me take your cholesterol medicine, it will help your cholesterol issues. But at the same time, it may have some of the side effects. Maybe you're dry mouth, maybe you're fatigued, maybe you some things. It's for us to try to reconcile these things. What did Durkheim come forward and say? Durkheim came forward and postulated that there are perhaps a few reasons as to why this is happening. One reason, he said, number one, is he said society was moving, as industrialization was increasing, society was moving from a, a communal society to an individualistic society. Whereas before the community was sacred, now the individual is sacred. Now both of them have pros and cons. I'm not here to make an argument either way. But he said one of the side effects of individual society, although it may make you become the best that you can possibly be, that's beautiful, but it sometimes has a collateral damage effect on your relations, your community, and your family. I, for example, I get into the top university, and I go across the country, I go across the world. It's a good thing. I get a job, I go across the world. But you may have an individual optimization, but the community may suffer. So he gives the example, he says, look, in an individualistic society, if you make it, you get all the glory. But if you don't, if you don't become the for Warren Buffett or X, Y, and Z, Warren Buffett himself says, I want the ovarian lobster. This word is not my word. He says, I worked hard, I did a lot of things, but I was very lucky to live in America. I was very lucky to live a long life. I was very lucky to have the mentors and teacher that I did. There's a lot of people who worked really, really hard, and they didn't have the access that I had. So he said, I should not be delusional about my success. So what he says, what Durkheim says, if you make it in an individualistic society, you get all the praise and the glory. But if you don't, you're in a much crueler place. Society says you didn't make it because you didn't try. You didn't make it because you didn't work hard enough. Whereas we know, for every Steve Jobs, for every Bill Gates, for every Warren Buffett, the graveyards of Silicon Valley are filled with thousands who worked. Not because they didn't try. Because there was circumstance at play. There was perhaps luck at play. There were other factors at play. The first element. The second element that he says is, that may cause societies to get very unhappy in the modern world is excessive hope. Now, hope is a beautiful thing. Hope is very important. Don't get me wrong here at all. But excessive hope, there may even be a limit by which, after which, it may be a problem. I'll give you an example. I've been to Paris, many of you have been there as well. So, there's a phenomenon called Paris Syndrome. It's well documented. What is Paris Syndrome? When tourists come to Paris, they have this dream of seeing the Eiffel Tower. And when they go there, especially Japanese tourists experience this a lot, amongst others. But they have this dream that they leave Tokyo, they land in Paris, they go and get their stuff ready, and they're going to go see the Eiffel Tower, they're going to come out the escalator from the subway, and they're going to see this amazing building that's going to be a euphoric moment. 
And when they go there, they get they land in Paris, they get there, they see the Eiffel Tower, they close their eyes, open their eyes, see the Eiffel Tower, and they fall into a severe depression. Mm. They say, hold on. I thought this was going to be amazing, but it's just a tower. We've been 15 days in Tokyo. What's the big deal? <laughs> and so the whole concept is that we sometimes say that when we say that we see that when you see, especially in our time of social media, you see someone who's like a multimillionaire, a billionaire, whatever, that it's attainable and that is something that should be attainable necessarily. We get deluded in thinking that's just what the purpose of life is. Whereas life may have a much richer purpose that we should be attuned to. At the third level, excessive freedom that their kind of postulates. Their kind of postulates. Too much freedom can also be a bad thing. Now you may say, freedom, I'm a big supporter of freedom, obviously, as we all are. But what does it mean, excessive freedom? Not in the sense of liberty, it's in a different sense. Allow me to explain. Dr. Barry Schwartz has written a book called The Paradox of Choice, which I invite you all to read. And he says that he sent, in his study, he sent two groups into the supermarket. And he said, I want to, group A, I want you to choose amongst these four brands of cereal. Pick one. He said, very well. He goes to group two, and group B says, I want you now to pick between these 20 different brands of cereal. And they pick. And so he calls them back into the lab, and Dr. Barry Schwartz said, I asked group A, hey, how many of you are satisfied with your decision out of the four that you chose? And they all said, we're happy, we're satisfied with our decision. Then he called group B in, and he said, how many of you are satisfied with your decision? And he said, all of them came forward and said, if we had more time, we would have chose something else. And the principle that emerges is this isn't about groceries, this isn't about so much, it's about life. That one of the elements that with freedom, that we end up so focused, and not the freedom of liberty, but more freedom and the concept of choice that we have, we sometimes don't appreciate what we have before us because we're so focused on the fear of missing out. And that means we miss out. So one should be grateful and have gratitude. That's the real element of the equation. In order for me to have empathy in my life, once I have empathy, then I can have gratitude that God Almighty has given me something in my life that I can share with someone else. Empathy, gratitude, generosity, that's the continuum. That's the secret of life. To understand that you are blessed, to understand that God has given you, but to first feel the pain, and then feel that you have grace in your life and then to actually give the action. When it comes to empathy and science, Dr. Daniel Kahneman at Princeton, he divided this up into three. He's found in his research that empathy has three types. There are three types of empathy. One is cognitive empathy, one is emotional empathy, and the third is compassionate empathy. Cognitive empathy is to feel, to think what the other person may be thinking. Emotional empathy is to actually feel it. And the third level, compassion and empathy, is not only to think it, not only to feel it, but to actually do and act to change what's going on, to actually change their state of affairs. That is what true compassion is in its life. The final two things that Durkheim says, beyond choice, beyond freedom, he says that one of the reasons that society may be declining, according to him, was the family structure is getting weaker, according to him. And uh, I often give the example of the community of Rosetta, Rosetta, Pennsylvania. That was a community of immigrants that came from Italy to the shores of America. They came to Pennsylvania. When they came to Pennsylvania, they had half the rate of cardiovascular disease compared to the rest of the United States at the time, the 1950s and 1960s. They had half the rate. And so the cardiologists and the sociologists were saying, what's going on here? They must be very healthy. They must not smoke. They must be all these things. So they went and they looked at the data and they went to the town and they said, hold on a second. They all smoke cigars and they all eat water. Not advising this at all. But eventually, so what's going on here? So they went into the city and they stopped there and they realized the way these people were living was totally different. They had brought their lifestyle and they had brought their, their culture from Italy to the shores of America. Every day they would all get together and cook in large pots in the afternoon and they would all sit on the table together, they would all eat together. What the sociologists and the cardiologists concluded was that their socio psychological dynamics of family and community were helping them live longer principle that you and I need to And the final thing that I'll leave here with is what Durkheim said was that perhaps one of the main reasons Durkheim himself was at least an, ag was an agnostic Jew. He was not the most practicing of what the story would say. But he said one of the reasons why people are becoming very unhappy, and he said this over 125 years ago, one of the reasons why people are getting so unhappy is the decline of religion. He said we need religion now perhaps more than ever. He said because of the structure that religion gives, the community, the sense of community that religion gives, the sense of camaraderie that religion gives. In America, in the last 50 years, loneliness has doubled. And loneliness, if you looked at the Harvard studies, the 75-year longitudinal study of Harvard, the most important secret to happiness in life 
is relationships, good, strong relationships. They go very far in life. I'm concluding here. The final thing that I want to mention for you and I is this. I've looked at studies. We found that today in America, the rate of suicide attempts amongst the African American males, young African American males, is skyrocketing. Similarly, when you read studies that have come out of Stanford, when they looked at different demographics, they looked at Jews, the Jewish community, they looked at Catholics and Protestants and Muslims, and they wanted to see what is the rate of attempted suicide amongst young people. They found the lowest rate was amongst the Jewish community, 3.6%. They found the second was around amongst the Protestant community at 5%. The Catholic community was 6% attempted suicide amongst young people of faith in America, and the highest rate of attempted suicide amongst Americans was amongst the Muslim community at 7.9%. When it was adjusted for factors, they found that it was actually 12%, double of the next demographic. Two demographics that are staying. But then I, I read another article that gave my perspective. And it said that in the middle age bracket, the people who are attempting the most suicide in America are actually white males. And what I realized is that every single person is suffering. We may not see it, but it's happening beneath the surface. Remember, suicide is a tip of the iceberg problem. When the Titanic sank, they got away from what they saw, but 90% of the mass is below the surface. You don't see a lot of people. You don't see the majority of people who are suffering. A final message of both part of one of my favorite studies, they said they wanted to look at, can you model emotions like viruses? You know, in the era of COVID, we realized that if you can, you have viruses that spread in cities very quickly, but can emotions, can happiness, can sadness, can these things spread? Can these things spread? And the final message came forward that in fact, yes, you can spread your emotions the same way that you spread viruses. And in fact, they found that you can spread your happiness to three degrees of separation. The Prophet Muhammad says that happiness or to smile is a form of charity. You and I can spread our happiness and our, our compassion to three people we've never met in our life. That's powerful. Think about how many people are here. And I can imagine, and you can imagine, that the opposite may also be true. If we have anger and angst and hatred, perhaps we can also pass that on. We ask God to allow us to be good servants of His. We ask of love and God to have compassion for everyone here and beyond the world. Thank you so much. Thanksgiving. 
meals to people in downtown Sanford gave us a new appreciation in life and the privileges that we have. Then we wanted to do something special for the children. So we have our yearly Shop with the Shade and Pop event, whereby children get an opportunity to go on a shopping spree for their Christmas toys. We also host various clothing and toy drives. We also wanted to do something for the Seminole family, giving back in the name of Imam Hussein, a personality who fought against oppression and injustice. The idea of Adopt a Park was suggested, and we adopted the Be More Park, making sure we keep it clean every quarter. So anybody wants to volunteer, please reach out to me. We wanted to educate teachers on the month of fasting and reaching out to the school board, enabling them to inform teachers why some students are not eating during lunch break. Amy, thank you for sharing your post on Facebook about Ramadan. That helped. While we usually pray at mosques or in our homes, COVID was a different situation where hospitals and healthcare workers we gave the agents of God to cure the sick and all their abilities. Having a prayer outside Advent Health Ultima showcased that faith is not bound to religious centers only. I am forever thank thankful to our educators, law enforcement, and healthcare workers. You show us the path and how we can serve in the name of God together. Before I conclude, this event would not be possible without our speakers, Tim Cook and Sage Javier Germani, our IFTAR sponsor, SP Funds, our dedicated volunteers who have been working throughout the day, and our master chef, where you're going to taste your food outside, Ms. Ruby Kamal. On behalf of Mr. Del Hay, I would like to sincerely thank you all. Thank you once again for joining us this evening, and we encourage you to make an effort tonight to meet someone you haven't before. May I ask our executive director, and I am calling you to come up with a few words. Place we love to call our home, 
are the great people. The wonderful leaders and community members who often go above and beyond to ensure our families and our communities are safe and have the support they need to thrive. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, The best of people is one who is the most helpful to others. Tonight, I would like to take a moment to convey a special thank you, to express our sincere gratitude to a leader and his entire organization of men and women who serve and protect us day in and day out. The Seminole County Sheriff's Office, under the leadership of Sheriff Dennis Luma, has been a pioneer in how law enforcement engaging with faith-based institutions is a win-win proposition for the community at large. As we look back over the years of our wonderful partnership and collaboration with the Seminole County Sheriff's Office, we are grateful for the opportunity to participate in many of the initiatives that Sheriff has led. Some of these highlights include hosting one of the quarterly faith-based partnership meetings right here at our mosque, the inclusion of faith in workforce where our very own sister Dinaz Menekia represented the Muslim community on a panel with other speakers, the prayer breakfast where our resident scholar Sayyid Kirmani offered the opening prayer, the recent International Women's Day event that took place, and the upcoming National Day of Prayer, which is being held next month. These are what we call models for what outreach in today's society must comprise, and we are honored to be part of the growth and the future of Seminole County. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of Master Zohei, please join me in welcoming Sheriff Lima as we present to him a token of our gratitude, Sheriff Dennis Lima. Thank you so much. 
Iftar celebrates the role of faith in the lives of our fellow Muslim Americans. This reminds us of our truth, that we are all servants of God, and that we all draw on a sense of strength and purpose from our beliefs. As believers of common faiths and backgrounds, we represent a global world. We are at our strongest when we draw on our diversity as a people to embrace common beliefs and celebrate our faiths under one God. We are not strong despite our diversity. We are strong because of it. As our noble Quran states in chapter 2, verse 136, Muslims say, We believe in God and what he has revealed to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and their descendants, and what was revealed to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction among them, and to God we have submitted ourselves. I'm so humbled to know that tonight we are celebrating our faith through unity, the very colorful spool of thread that weaves our lives together. Brothers and sisters, I graciously thank you for attending our annual Interfaith of Thar this evening. Please feel free to proceed to the courtyard at this time where dinner will be served. If you wish to observe prayer, please feel welcome to stay inside where the mother prayer will be held. Thank you all very much for attending. Have a great evening.